go on to screen share and we will kick off. Nicola, perhaps you could just tell me that that's worked. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. OK. All right. Um, so thank you very much for coming this morning. Um, my name's Jane Davis and I work at the National Heart and Lung Institute and also at the Royal Brompton Hospital as part of the paediatric respiratory team there. And my main research interest is in cystic fibrosis. Um, and Andy has asked me to give you an update this morning which I think we'll talk a little bit about the um, underlying pathophysiology of CF, but also in a little bit more detail about some of the remarkable changes that have happened over the last couple of years um, in our approach to being able to treat people with CF. I am going to talk about some drugs which are close to getting licensed, but are probably best considered experimental at the moment. Um, and we do have a very active trials pipeline at the Brompton where we work as advisors and trial leaders for some of the companies I'll talk about. Okay. So I think I'm forwarding, but it hasn't forwarded on my screen. Oh, there we go. All right. So um, those of you who aren't directly involved in cystic fibrosis will probably have learned about it in some detail as part of your paediatric training anyway. You'll be aware that in the 50s and 60s, it began to become understood as a, a syndrome, a multi-organ syndrome, um, which was inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion. So two healthy carrier parents with a one in four chance of each child having the disease. It was initially recognized mainly related to uh, the sort of malnutrition that you see in this picture here. Um, severe pancreatic exocrine disease leading to fat malabsorption, diarrhea, wasting, um, and post-mortems, which occurred very sadly very early in this era, showed this destructive fibrosis of the pancreas. So it was actually called cystic fibrosis of the pancreas for a long time. It was a while before the link to chest disease was recognized um, because there was very early childhood mortality. Um, and so the way that this disease hung together really became problematic in terms of understanding. Um, I'm showing a picture here that you might think is very odd. But the reason for this is it was a, a fortuitous uh, turning point in our understanding of cystic fibrosis when there was a heat wave in New York it's sometime in the late 1950s. Um, and this was really quite a remarkable heat. It went on for several days. And there was a pediatrician at the local hospital that you can see on the right there, Dorothy Anderson, who for the first time uh, made the link between profound hyponatremic dehydration and cystic fibrosis when she noticed that several of her little patients with CF of the pancreas were admitted very dehydrated and with low sodiums. Um, she worked together with this biochemist here that you can see on the left called the Santignase, and their initial assumption was that this was some sort of salt losing nephropathy. Um, but they quickly found out that looking at the urines, the sodium was incredibly low as well. And Paul de Santignes said the only other possible place that this was being lost from was the sweat. And so that really led to a fundamental step change in the way we understand cystic fibrosis. Um, what you'll see here is a diagram of the normal sweat duct where you can see that um, fluid comes through into the sweat gland. And the purpose of this of sweat obviously is to cool down the body, but without losing anything by way of nutrients. So normal processes would allow all of the salt to be reabsorbed into the body. And the main iron channel, which does that is this one here called CFTR, cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, brings chloride back into the body and sodium probably follows down an osmotic gradient largely. Um, what happens in cystic fibrosis is either this channel is not there or it doesn't function properly. So the chloride stays in the sweat and gets produced onto the body. The sodium sticks with it. Um, and in some cases, as was seen during that heat wave, uh, this can lead to really profound body losses. But actually more importantly, and, and probably of more direct relevance, this then became the diagnostic gold standard test for this disease. So how we do this is um, we stimulate the skin to produce uh, increased amounts of sweat uh, by passing a very, very low level electrical current through some pilocarpine gels, as you can see there. 
they're then removed and there is what we now use most commonly, this very, very small capillary tube wound around this system here, which sucks the sweat up into the bore of the tube. It's got an indicator in it, so you can see when that's full, and it's this sort of blue dye you can see here. And this is then chopped out and sent to the biochemistry lab where um, chloride and sodium can be measured. Chloride is the most uh, sensitive distinguishing test. We don't really measure sweat sodium anymore. There are a few labs around the world who are relying on conductance, which is a measure of total iron content in the sweat, uh, but that's also probably not quite so sensitive. So you can see here, um, the sorts of sweat chloride values that we see in cystic fibrosis. CFPI means cystic fibrosis with pancreatic insufficiency. That's the classical conventional cystic fibrosis that about 90% of people have. Um, and you can see sweat median sweat chloride levels of around 100. There is um, a number of mutations, and I'll talk about them later, which lead to um, a somewhat milder phenotype in the gut with a preservation of pancreatic exocrine function and the median levels in those patients is slightly lower as you can see here but look over to the far left this is the healthy controls with median levels in the teens it's not unusual to have levels in single figures so a very big difference between these two groups with some merging in the gap the diagnostic threshold for cystic fibrosis is at 60 millimoles per litre, and this range between 30 and 60 is what's regarded as an intermediate range requiring some further workup. So this test was first developed in the late 50s, early 60s, and it's really stood the test of time. So it is still the gold standard diagnostic test, despite all of the other things that we now have available to us. Things took another um, uh, big step change in 1989 when the cystic fibrosis gene was discovered. Um, I remember this really well. It was the early days of my pediatric training and um, the excitement was, was absolutely palpable. One of the things which uh, got bandied around very rapidly was that before we knew it, gene therapy would be a reality. And we're now 30 years later and, and still we're not yet treating patients with cystic fibrosis with gene therapy, um, but the understanding that came from this finding um, has led to a complete change in the way that we do manage patients with CF now. So what we understand then is that the gene product, the CFTR channel, sits in the apical surface of cell membranes. It's particularly relevant in epithelia lining um, duct so for example, the epithelia of the airway, the pancreatic ducts, the liver, the gut, etc. But I think we also understand that it's found within cells, in organelles, and it's probably also playing some degree of an important role in, for example, neutrophils um, circulating in inflammatory cells. Oops, I'm sorry. It's a dynamic channel, so it's can be open or closed. You can see here in this picture that this is the channel open. It allows chloride to uh, transport out onto the epithelial cell surface. And the opening and closing is governed by the positioning of this regulatory domain um, in an energy dependent fashion. So it's dependent on ATP. Um, if we consider the CFTR channels lining the, the healthy airway at the moment, it's estimated that they're opening and closing about 50% of the time. Um, if we get up and run around the block, we may need to hydrate our airways more and therefore the open time might increase. So in the normal airway, you can see here in red the CFTR sitting on the apical surface. In response to some of these chemical signals, it will allow chloride to pass through it onto the airway surface. But it also plays another important role with its neighboring channel, which is the epithelial sodium channel. And it actually exerts an inhibitory function on that in normal health. So it allows small amounts of sodium into the cells without that getting out of hand. And the purpose really of this is to regulate the amount of salt on the cell surface to regulate the amount of water on the cell surface. So we can see here on the far side, uh, this is a common scenario in cystic fibrosis. The protein is made, but there's something wrong with it and it doesn't get to the right place in the cell. Those chemical instructions don't lead to chloride secretion, 
but we also lose this inhibitory function of the sodium channel and too much sodium comes into the epithelium and the, the, per, the um, downstream consequence of that is that water follows down an osmotic gradient and we get therefore a relative decrease in the amount of fluid on the epithelial surface and you can see that here in this very elegant experiment that came out of the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and this was one of the first groups to describe this so-called low volume hypothesis. These are respiratory epithelia grown as a monolayer. On the left is normal and on the right is CF. And at the start of the experiment, there's this fixed volume of green fluorescent liquid placed on the surface of those epithelia. 24 hours later, you can see very, very stark differences in how much of that liquid layer remains. So the CF epithelia have actually drunk up the liquid. And the consequences of that can be seen quite nicely in these electron micrographs. Um, the consequences are that the cilia on the surface of respiratory epithelia are not able to stand up properly and beat. And instead of that, they're folded over and squashed down. Um, mucosillary clearance uh, gets impaired. And there's also, you can see on the CF slide there, an abundance of mucus. There's an excess of mucus producing cells and that mucus is itself rather viscous and dehydrated. And that leads to a combined failure of mucociliary clearance and a predisposition to infection and the consequences of that, which is inflammation in the airway. And you can see that cascade here. So um, starting at the top, um, two abnormal CFTR genes leads to abnormal production of CFTR that can be in a number of different ways, and I'll talk you through that later. But the consequence of that is that chloride secretion is impaired, there's excess sodium and water absorption and mucociliary clearance suffers. We get thick dehydrated mucus, infection and inflammation, and then we start to see the consequences that we recognize in the clinic. So small airway plugging, airway inflammation, and ultimately irreversible uh, dilatation and scarring of the airways in the form of bronchiectasis. And respiratory failure is still the commonest cause of death in people with cystic fibrosis. On the last registry report in the UK, um, the median age of death is still very, very young at about 30 years. So we're, we're still looking at a disease of young adulthood. It's no longer a disease which commonly kills children. It was uh, certainly that in the early years of, of its description and even when I was a trainee. Um, but it's relatively unusual now, thank goodness, for us to see uh, deaths in paediatrics, um, but mortality is still young. So there has been some advance in our understanding of that rather oversimplified cascade that have come from transgenic animal models. Um, the first probably 20 of these to be developed were mice, and um, I heard a fantastic lecture from one of the scientists involved in that, um, recently who started off his lecture by saying you know i've been involved in the development of a transgenic cf mouse for 20 years and i apologize because we probably set the whole understanding of cf back enormously during that time um, and I, I think really we now recognize that the cf mice do not recapitulate respiratory disease in any meaningful fashion you can try and give them lung disease they don't really get it they're quite hard to breed because they do get gut disease um, but there's been massive improvements recently in larger animal models. And the first of these to, I think, change our understanding of CF somewhat was the uh, cystic fibrosis pig. But there has since been a ferret and rabbits and maybe even uh, some of the rat, I think. But um, we were understanding a lot more. And one of the things that we have understood is it's not just chloride and water that may be involved in airway disease in CF. And I'm just going to quickly show you a very nice experiment which helped understand this. So this took the cystic fibrosis pig. They had these very, very small little grids and embedded onto those grids were bacteria. You can see in this particular uh, picture, these are staphylococci, but they also did it with pseudomonas, which is a common bacterium in the CF lung. Um, they stuck these bacteria onto the grids and then they placed the grids momentarily onto the airway surface of the pigs. And um, they were testing the hypothesis that there was something in the airway surface liquid that would aid in killing of those bacteria. So they then took the grids and applied a live dead stain, which allows living bacteria to stain green, whereas dead bacteria will stain red. 
and they could then microscopically image these grids and count the number of living and dead bacteria. And what they found was that there was a bacterial de killing defect that was present in the CF pig, which was not related to decreased mucosillary clearance or, or dehydration of the airway. It was related to the pH being abnormal. And what came from that is that we now understand there is a, a link somewhere in this where in addition to secreting chloride onto the airway surface, CFTR also secretes bicarbonate. Bicarbonate seems to be important in bacterial killing on the airway surface, at least in these large animal models. It's quite difficult to measure in people, and there's a small number of studies which have looked at this, and the, the findings so far have not been completely clear cut. Um, but I think most people accept that it's very likely this is involved. And it's definitely involved in the pancreas and the gut, where a bicarbonate um, secretion impacts uh, the digestive system. So all of this leads to uh, what you can see here, a very multi-organ uh, disease. If we start at the top right, um, it's not just the lower airway which is affected, it's also the upper airway with sinus infections and nasal polyps. In the lower airway, I've described why you get frequent lung infections and inflammation, and this leads over time to reduced lung function. Largely, we're measuring that by spirometry in the form of FEV1, which I'll show you some graphs of later. Um, progressive lung disease from which most people with CF will ultimately die. You can come down further, see the impact on the sweat, which I've talked to you about. Um, but it also impacts other parts of the body. Um, one of the most sensitive organs in the body to loss of CFTR function is actually the male reproductive tract. And most men with cystic fibrosis will have infertility related to this condition, CBABD, which is congenital bilateral absence of vas deferens. So in utero, the vas deferens starts to form. The little, very, very small ducts that are required to remain patent fail to remain patent because there's a lack of uh, liquid in their, in their lumen um, and basically they just regress usually in utero. Coming over to the left at the bottom then you can see uh, the GI tract is impacted, um, pancreatic exocrine insufficiency but also over the course of a lifetime with cystic fibrosis the endocrine pancreas starts to become affected as well and we have a very common complication of adolescence and adulthood which is CF related diabetes. Um, and then top left you can see the liver is also commonly affected and um, focal biliary cirrhosis can occur. We do see CF as a cause of um, neonatal jaundice although it's not that common um, and in fact there is a small minority of CF patients who end up requiring a liver transplant, despite the fact their lungs may not be uh, all that severely affected. So it can affect different people um, in different ways, but that is the sort of multi-organ constellation of the disease. So Nicola asked me to include a couple of multi-choice question slides. So just to make sure people are actually awake. Um, these are the questions that I posed for the first part of the talk. Um, Nicola, are you going to put the voting up for me to read out or shall I just stick with this at the moment? I can put it up so that people can be thinking about okay. it and answering as you, as you uh, talk through it. Okay, so which of the following are true about CF? There could be one or there could be more than one. They're not all false, I'll tell you that now. So um, CF is a dominantly inherited genetic condition. Babies with CF are born with severe lung damage. Males with CF are most commonly infertile. CFTR is an iron channel conducting chloride and sodium. Nice to see some people voting, that's great. Looks like we might have plateaued at the number of votes there. So I'm, I'm really, thank you for voting. Really pleased to see that the one statement that is correct has got the most votes. So fantastic, yes, most males with CF are infertile. Um, just to go through some of the other issues, the, the first one with a little a bit of a trick because it's actually a recessively inherited genetic condition. Um, so it doesn't run through families as we would see uh, dominant conditions to and often will come as a complete surprise to a family. Um, none of you thought that babies are born with severe lung damage, that's correct. 
most people think that the lungs are pretty normal at birth and if we keep them in that way we would be doing a very good job and then the last um, bullet point was a little bit of a trick as well because um, CFTR conducts chloride it doesn't conduct sodium it interacts with its neighboring channel the ENAC channel uh, which influences the sodium conductance so well done for that that's great I will um, turn that off and we'll go on to the next section of this Apologies, sometimes my screen is being just a bit slow to move on. Okay. So I've put this slide up just to talk through the multitude of approaches to treating people with cystic fibrosis that we have and to show you a little bit of the evolution of these since the 1950s where the story started but also to show you the impact that that uh, evolution has had on the successful survival of people with cystic fibrosis. So um, at the bottom, you can see their pancreatic enzymes. These were developed fairly early on. They were not very good, a bit rough and ready, but they did allow people to eat a more normal diet. And um, this very early infant mortality from failure to thrive um, was improved as a result of that. Most of the other treatments on there you will see focus on the lungs. So clearing mucus from the lungs with physiotherapy, treating um, bacterial infections both in a preventative and a um, in treatment fashion. And then uh, RHDNAs, this is um, a mucolytic treatment which allows that viscous sputum to become thinner, runnier and easier to cough up. Um, inhaled antibiotics have been developed and there's quite a few of those now. Um, azithromycin is used commonly as a, we presume it's working largely in an anti-inflammatory fashion. And then we've got a variety of other improvements to enzymes, hypertonic saline, which is also a nebulizer to rehydrate the airway, and ASLI and TIP on new, um, newer antibiotic inhaled formulations. So two things to say about this. One is that there's been fantastic progress with these more conventional treatments. But the second thing is that um, they're all treating the consequences of cystic fibrosis as opposed to the cause of CF. And the biggest change has happened because we've been able to treat the cause. Now, the other thing about this is that it is a massive treatment burden. If you go onto Google, you'll find all sorts of pictures like this. You know, this is me and my daily treatment for keeping well. Um, it looks like this young person's actually receiving some IV antibiotics, so this may be during an exacerbation. But even when they're well, um, it's not at all uncommon for people to be spending a couple of hours every day to try and manage their CF and keep themselves out of hospital. And then the, that sort of stability is punctuated by episodes of exacerbation or flare-ups of their lung disease, which bring them into hospital. And every time one of those flare-ups happens, there is a potential for some irreversible loss of lung function. So we really do need to get better treatments, but we also need to get better treatments that don't just add to the treatment burden, uh, but that can begin to take away some of that burden. And we know that treatment burden is a very, very important issue for people with CF. There's been a recent James Lind priority setting alliance with them, and it was the thing that came out top priority for them is something to reduce this treatment burden. So I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about how I think we might most successfully do that and how we've made real big progress over the last decade in doing that. And the way in which that has been achieved is in the development of new drugs which target the CFTR defect itself. So unlike everything that came before, these drugs now actually seek to address the underlying cause of cystic fibrosis rather than the downstream consequences it's not very easy and it's going to be a little bit um, difficult to describe. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the CFTR genetic. So the first thing to say is that cystic fibrosis is caused by defects in a single gene, the CFTR gene, but there is a huge number of different defects that can occur in that gene. Over 2000 mutations have been described worldwide now. Most of them are very, very rare and the commonest one is very, very common. So if you just look for a moment at um, the discrepancy in the frequency of cystic fibrosis, the, the um, country in Europe which is most commonly, uh, the prevalence is highest, is Ireland, 
Um, that where the prevalence is lowest is Finland. You can see the frequency of cystic fibrosis, one in 1,400 in Ireland. In the UK, it's estimated to be about one in 2,200 live births. You can see probably for every single country that you look at that the top mutation is this thing called F508-DEL, and this is commonest worldwide. But then if you look at the second if you look at the second and third um, of these, you can see that they're really quite different in different regions. And um, this creates actually a really quite a big problem in terms of how we think about genetic diagnosis, but also treatments which are targeting um, the CFTR gene. This is the top 25 CFTR mutations in the US. They're pretty similar to the European ones. And the first thing is if you take everybody with CFs, um, different chromosomes, 85% of them with CF have this particular mutation, which is called f 508 del This means a deletion of phenylalanine at position 508. And I'll tell you a little bit later what that um, means. The next most common is present on less than 5% of chromosomes. And then you can see very rapidly, we come down into very, very small figures, even less than 1% as we go down. And this is just the top 25 of those 2000 that have been described. Um, so you can see that, that, that really this is quite a complex genetic condition. <clears throat> There's two reasons why CFTR genetics are important. And the first of those is in uh, newborn screening and making the diagnosis. The second is going to be the treatment I'll talk about. But I thought it was just worth one slide on newborn screening. Um, this has expanded very rapidly since the gene was discovered. Most of the programs rely on a heel prick test early in life, similar to those um, other heel prick tests screening for hypothyroidism, etc. Um, and most of them include a step where they look for raised levels of a pancreatic protein. And then on the basis of a certain cutoff of that, we'll look at mutation analysis. Um, there are a number of advantages to early diagnosis, including particularly better nutrition, but also that we can institute early physio and antibiotics. And very importantly, I think, genetic counselling so that parents are aware that cystic fibrosis is a risk for future pregnancies. So before we had a newborn screening, there would occasionally be a child who'd get diagnosed late, by which point the parents had already had another baby who also had CF. Here's the evolution across Europe over the last 20 years of newborn screening. You can see it's very, very rapidly become adopted in many, many parts of Europe. It's been commoner for longer, in fact, in parts of the US and Australasia. Um, there are still pockets of the world which don't yet have access to newborn screening. So the other reason why genetics is important is in uh, the development of these new drugs, which are termed modulators as a class of drugs. Um, and what modulators are seeking to do is alter the behavior of the faulty CFTR protein to make it function more like a normal one. So because there's lots of different ways in which those gene mutations can impact protein um, production in the cell, I'll just talk you through that in a little bit of detail. What we've got here on the left is a cross-section through a cell. Down at the bottom here is the nucleus. Here is the uh, organelles of the cytoplasm, and then at the top you can see the uh, epithelial cell surface. Um, and so the first way in which the CFTR can be deficient is that it's just not made at all. And that occurs when there is a nonsense mutation within the CFTR gene, and we just get a fragment of CFTR produced which is short and non-functional. And that occurs in about 10% of people with cystic fibrosis. The commonest type of mutation of which this f 508 del is the prime example is when the protein gets made in its full length there's something wrong somewhere in the middle of it which means it doesn't fold up properly so the f 508 del mutation affects a part of the protein where disulfide bonds are very very important for folding and if the protein can't fold properly it doesn't sort of traffic up through the cell and get its sugars put on it in the way it should and it never makes it to the cell membrane. All of the other types of mutations lead to the protein which reaches the cell surface but doesn't work properly when it gets there. So here in the middle you can see what we call a class 3 or defective gating. There's something wrong with the inside of that channel when it gets its instructions to open, it doesn't open. It's a bit like a plug stuck in a plug hole. 
Um, there's another type which uh, leads to opening of the channel, but the pore is abnormal. So usually the charge is, is faulty and it doesn't allow the negatively charged ions to go through it. And then there's a few other types of mutations which just lead to either not enough protein being there or the protein has a short half-life and, and this, you know, it's, it's not there for long enough. And this classification has really led to three different groups in terms of how we might think about modulated drugs. The first of these groups, unfortunately, will never be amenable to small molecule modulators in the sense that we understand them at the moment because these drugs are designed to work on protein that is present and if there's no protein made then the drug won't work. These are the sorts of patients for whom gene therapy uh, might ultimately be amenable and there are other approaches such as read-through drugs which are in development but haven't yet got to the clinic. So for these uh, groups of patients where they have a, a protein that doesn't get to the cell surface, they really need to do something about trafficking that protein up to the cell surface. And the term that's been adopted for those drugs is called correctors. So they correct the misfolding and they allow the drug to get up to the cell surface. It became clear quite early on that the drugs we've got at our disposal at the moment can do that, but they don't do it enough. There is an additional step needed to improve the function once that protein is there. And the drugs that, uh, that do that are called potentiators. So they kickstart the activity of the protein if it's in the right place. You can probably spot that those drugs on their own might be useful for the other mutations which are already at the cell surface. And certainly that was the lowest hanging fruit when uh, different groups were trying to develop these drugs was to say let's actually look at these people who've got protein in the right place that might be easier to fix and let's design these drugs these so-called potentiators and that's where we've had the most immediate success so uh, these are sometimes called gating mutations for obvious reasons uh, it's a little bit like the gate is locked you provide a drug which forces that gate to open and then uh, you can allow the chloride and the bicarbonate to traffic, to, to transport through, uh, through the channel. And the first of these to be developed and to get to the clinic is Ivacafta. Some of you may have heard of this. The trade name is Kaleidico. And um, here are some uh, phase three data from trials in adolescents and adults with cystic fibrosis showing just how impactful this drug is. I should probably say that all of the drugs being developed at the moment are systemic. So they're given by mouth and the fantastic um, benefits of that means that you're not only treating the lung as many inhaled drugs would you can also treat the gut the pancreas potentially and interestingly also it allows us the possibility to use a biomarker by way of sweat chloride so you can see here first of all this really really big impact on the sweat chloride concentration in people who are taking this drug who have a gating defect um, the very rapid drop to below that diagnostic threshold some of the people in that group even came below the 30, which is really widely regarded as normal. And that happened quite quickly, actually, within the first few days of taking the drug. Um, what was more important clinically was what happened to the lungs. And there was an improvement of more than 10% in the, the commonest readout we use for CF, which is the FEV1. Um, and <clears throat> just to put that in context, most of the other drugs we were using in clinic coming through trials have led to a sort of 3 to 4% improvement. So really very, very dramatic. You can see on the bottom left there, a big impact on pulmonary exacerbations, um, most of them leading to hospitalisation. And also on the bottom right, a quite an interesting improvement in weight gain. Um, these were older patients, most of them were not particularly underweight. Um, but an improvement towards normalization of their BMIs, slightly slower than the improvements we were seeing in the lung. And that subsequently turned out to be related to gut bicarbonate secretion and improvements in the way um, pancreatic enzymes that people were taking were able to work. So this is all fantastic, apart from the fact that people who can take a potentiator on, it on their own are a real minority. So you may recall when I was showing you that sort of pie chart earlier, it's about 5% of people have the commonest of the gating mutations, which is called G551D, and not many people have the rarer ones. So great drug, um, real inequities in the possibility of the CF uh, population as a whole benefiting. So this really is where we need to be 
putting our attention is on the F508 Dell. This is a possessed by most people in the world with cystic fibrosis. Could, can I just ask, the cleaner has just started hoovering outside the room. Nicola, can you hear it? A little bit, but it's not, it's not too bad, it's fine. It's not too bad, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Carry on. First, first world problem and all that. Um, Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about 508 Dell. So as I've described, this is a defect which leads to abnormal folding. And if a protein is not folded up normally, it doesn't pass up through the um, Golgi. It, it actually gets degraded in the intracellular dust ring, which is the proteasome system. Um, and correctors are these drugs which can allow the um, protein to refold so that the natural trafficking processes can get it up to the cell surface. I did mention that the early drugs that seemed to do this were not efficient enough on their own, but when they were combined with either CAFTA or the potentiator, we did begin to see some benefit. You can see here, this is a group of patients with two copies of 508DEL, the homozygous for 508DEL. That's about 50% of the worldwide population with cystic fibrosis, so this is obviously a big, a big group. Um, this in green is the placebo group, in blue is uh, two treatment groups merged together. And you can see there was quite a rapid improvement in FEV1 in patients who were taking that, but it was only about 3%. So about a third of the impact that we saw with either CAFTA engaging mutations. The placebo group then rolled over and you see that, but you still see this decline happening over the course of a year or two. There was perhaps a bigger impact on exacerbations if we look at hospitalization or intravenous antibiotics. Um, and most people feel that even though this wasn't a highly beneficial acutely in lung function, that impact on exacerbations was worth having. Um, there was a second combination, uh, which rather than Lumacafta, as you saw earlier, this is Tezacafta, really very, very similar, but better tolerated. And I think probably at this point, most people were feeling modest compared with Ivacafta, but um, certainly better than nothing. You may be aware that there was then a very sort of long and vocal fight to get access to this drug. These drugs are very, very expensive. The NHS initially didn't uh, think it was good value for money. Um, and whilst patients in the US have been getting these drugs for about five years now, um, patients in the NHS have been getting access to them since about last October. But there's been a very big improvement since then, and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that because I think those dual drugs are probably not going to be used widely for very much longer. Um, and this is what we call triple combination. So we started out with a single potentiator, we then went on to dual corrector and potentiators, and now triple combinations have become a thing. Um, might be worth thinking why they're needed, and the reason they're needed is because the F508 DEL protein misfolding is a very complicated misfolding. It's not a simple thing to fix. Um, and maybe more than one approach is going to be needed. So the way I try and describe this is if you imagine trying to sort out this tangle of wool, you might need a certain set of tools to be able to get them into uh, some sort of a sorted ball. But if actually what you want to do is to knit a garment, you need a completely different set of tools. And this is really the approach that's being taken is the application of two different corrector molecules which are addressing different misfolding steps within that protein and then the addition of the potentiator to boost the function. And we've got here data from two recent publications uh, from the end of last year um, from two different studies and I'll talk you through these. Um, on the top line this is a study in patients who have got a single copy of the F508 DEL mutation and then a mutation on their other allele which will never respond to a modulator. So it's one of these, mostly these class one mutations, there's no CFTR um, protein produced. Um, and so these are heterozygotes with a single copy of F508 DEL. And one might imagine that only a very powerful drug would be good enough to see an improvement just by harnessing the F508 DEL function. Um, and you immediately see responses which I think were certainly much bigger than I was expecting. So on the left there is um, FEV1, so improvement in lung function, and that's about 14% from baseline compared to placebo with this triple combination. Um, on the right, you can see a very big impact on pulmonary exacerbations in that group of patients. 
And then there was a smaller study, a shorter study of only four weeks in patients who had two copies of their 508 gel. And the design was completely different because, as mentioned, in many parts of the world, this group of patients already had access to the dual combinations. So what this was designed to add the sort of what they were calling the next generation corrector on top of that and look at just the impact of that drug. And you can see here, compared to the dual, about a further 10% uplift in FEV1. So if you add those two together, that's going to be about 13% as well. Intriguing then that both the heterozygous group and the homozygous group have similar improvements. Here is the changes in both of those trial groups in sweat chloride, so a massive drop, as you saw for Kaleidico. The middle panel is the CFQR, that's a quality of life score. And the blue dotted line is at what we call the minimal clinically important difference of four units. So way above this, these patients feel fantastic when they get on this drug. And then the far right, the longer of those studies um, measured BMI and showed substantial improvement. Here's where those two uh, studies have been published in the New England Journal towards the uh, fourth quarter of last year. And I think it's fair to say this was probably the response of the CF community to these data. Um, really, really big impacts, but for the first time, now looking at a drug that's potentially applicable for the vast majority of people with cystic fibrosis, because if we add together those um, who have um, one or two copies of F508 DEL, it's about 85 to 90% of the global population of people because the 508 DEL is so common. So we've got the, um, the final multiple choice questions. Uh, this is a really complicated field and I expect that for people hearing this for the first time, it's been a bit difficult to digest and take in. So um, you know, I'm not expecting people to necessarily score well on these. Um, Nicola, would you kindly put up the voting panel and I'll go through it. Okay, so which of the following are true? So same as previously, um, none of these are, uh, it's not that all of these are false. So CFTR potentiators move misfolded protein to the cell surface. Triple compounds will be useful in approximately 25% of people with cystic fibrosis. NHS patients will have, will have access to triple compounds in 2020 and pancreatic insufficiency may be reversed if drugs are started early in life. Now, I've been a bit facetious because some of these things I haven't actually told you and we'll go into once people have guessed at the answers. So don't worry about guessing at them and I'll talk to you about whether they're true or false afterwards. Nicola, could you scroll down a bit? Because I can't see the answer to the fourth bullet at the moment on my screen. For some reason, it won't let me do that, Jane. OK, well, never mind. I can see it's 71 percent. OK, well, that, that's remarkable. You've done brilliantly considering I didn't actually tell you the answer to the ones that were correct. <laughs> so, um, at the top, um, the, it's the potentiators that activate the protein once it's in the right place and it's correctors that move the misfolded protein. So most of you, I think, got that right. Um, triple compounds will be useful for about 85% of people with CF. Um, NHS patients will have access to triple in 2020. How you knew that, I don't know because I hadn't mentioned it. We're really, really excited. Having waited four years for NHS to approve funding for the dual compounds, we expected we might be in for a sort of battle. Um, but some of you might have seen Simon Stevens on the news recently saying that as soon as they get their license fully approved, which is probably going to be September, we will be able to prescribe these drugs. So that's fantastic. And also, I don't know how you knew the latter one. Um, we have got nice evidence now that pancreatic insufficiency, which we always thought was irreversible, might actually be reversed if drugs are started early in life. And, and that's really exciting to, to figure that out. Um, I may have a slide to show you that. I can't quite remember what I've got next. Um, OK, so thanks for voting there. Let me see if I can go forward again. Yep, OK. This is just to show what the landscape looks at, at like at the moment. Um, I've updated this very recently since the announcement um, from Simon Stevens this July. Um, 
highly effective tends to be the term we use for either the IVACAFTA and the gating mutations or these triple molecules. So things that lead to a 10% plus improvement in lung function as opposed to the rather more modest um, impacts. And of course, I haven't included here large swathes of the globe which are likely to have very delayed access or even never get access. You know, those countries in which CF is a really ultra orphan disease where they don't have access to high cost medicines. And I think it's something that's really important we think about as we celebrate our moving forward into, into access that you know, there will be big inequities globally across the F population. Um, I've talked so far about drugs which have all come from a single drug company, which is called Vertex. They're all over to the left of this slide. But just to highlight that there's a lot of other companies quite active, most of them at phase two clinical trials, trying to develop molecules which will be competitors potentially to these ones. I think that's important because there is a small population of people who might not tolerate certain drugs, but also we need to get a bit of competition into the field to drive the pricing down. So we're part of trials networks that really support these trials and, and these competitive drugs being tested. And then finally, just as we're all paediatric, important to think about um, the fact that the progression of CF, uh, both lung and other organ disease, uh, is usually in a single direction that if we start any of these really useful treatments once lung damage has already happened, we're probably not going to turn back the clock on that. But could we achieve more by starting early? I think many of us think we could probably prevent lung disease or at least prevent the rate of decline that we're seeing in patients if we start early. And there are certainly trials to look at that at the moment. But there is also some evidence of the pancreas being impacted. And... Um, as an example, if we measure the uh, biomarker fecal elastase, so pancreatic elastase in the stool, um, it's very low in children with pancreatic insufficiency, and we can see it get restored when patients have started some of these uh, highly effective drugs. This is just to show you how active the uh, CF clinical trial field is. This is the European Clinical Trials Network and the number of sites across Europe, um, which are part of this really big network. We have a, a similar sort of network in North America, which is probably about three times the size. And we all work to very coordinated protocols. We do shared protocol review, et cetera. Um, and it's really allowed uh, progress in the field much more quickly than it would have been without it. And more recently, the Cystic Fibrosis Trust in the UK has also set up a, a network, which is called the Accelerator Platform, and you can see here there's quite a large number of sites all coming together to try and deliver trials of these new treatments uh, as quickly as we can and as efficiently as we can. And it's probably important to say, although I haven't majored on that now, um, I do think it's still important that we continue to push forward on what you might regard as more conventional treatments. So new formulations of antimicrobials or anti-inflammatory treatments. Um, it's the first time ever recently the adult CF population has become bigger than the paediatric in most developing countries, most developed countries. Um, and those adults will be living with uh, a degree of established disease. Um, and so we're working hard to try and improve treatments across the board, not just these modulators. So thank you for listening. Um, here is my contact details. If anybody would, if you've been enthused by this and you'd like to get in touch, um, we're very, very keen to encourage uh, paediatric people into CF, both clinically and from research aspects. And we've often got projects that are available for people to engage with, sometimes have posts coming up, for example, helping us deliver and run some of our clinical trials. So I'd love to hear from any of you if you've been infused by any of this um, or if you've got any other questions or what wasn't clear. And I will stop sharing my screen and maybe Andy, if there's anything on the chat, I'm happy to answer questions or if people want to unmute themselves and ask then also happy for that. Jane, thanks very much indeed. There's nothing on the chat at the moment. Um, I think if there's a one disease that has illustrated the importance of really understanding the basic science and how it has actually gone from being what, one might think of sort of slightly anorakic molecular genetics to an enormous therapeutic step forward, which could not have happened without that understanding. That disease is cystic fibrosis. But I guess one of yeah. the challenges is, I mean, I'm 
old enough to remember when DNAs came in, Pulmazine, and it was £8,000, and everybody said, oh my God, the end of the world has come, we can't afford this. And these are now six-figure medications. How are we going to afford them in the UK, and how are we going to, how are we going to get access to in an LMIC setting for the CF patients there? And I've already, I'm sure you have had emails from places like India saying, how can I get hold of this stuff? You're right, Andy. I think it is one of the biggest challenges. Um, and I, I don't think that there is an easy answer to that question. Um, I think it is going to be a combination of um, bringing some competition into the space and continuing to try and work alongside some of the companies to encourage them to be um, a sort of fair in their approach. At least one of these companies has already started considering a more equitable access platform for developing countries. Um, whether or not they will actually come to fruition, I don't know, but um, I think it is one of our biggest challenges, certainly. And it was a challenge that was met with the HIV drugs, um, where the, the success of the, the campaigns that were spearheaded by the low and middle income settings have got them, got them there, when at one stage they were enormously expensive and out of, uh, out of range. Yeah, I agree. Um, one of the challenges I think that's a little different, and I've heard some health economists talk about this, is that um, in the context of HIV, there was a huge power in numbers from some of those developing countries because the disease burden was enormous. Absolutely. And in contrast, the disease burden is probably smaller, but also rather unquantified in a lot of these more developing countries. You know, uh, with some exceptions, many of them don't have good uh, networks even for delivering clinical care for cystic fibrosis. So perhaps one of the challenges for us in the developed world is to try and enable that um, to actually so that, for example, registries can be developed, clinical care delivery networks can be established, uh, because I think without the lobbying that comes with that, um, with, with that sort of mass effect, then it's going to remain really quite difficult. Are there questions from other people? I mean, this is really, I mean, the, the science behind all this is just staggering. And I think, think back to the, <clears throat> the, old, the old days, as my, one of my children said, in the old days, Daddy, when you were alive, there was, uh, the, 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 and CF was all reactive. You know, power in, power in with the antibiotics and stuff like that, bit of DNAs. And now this extraordinary science that has delivered and will presumably go on deliver go on delivering um, what, are, what are fundamentally transformative treatments. And um, one of the one of the gaps that may be obvious to people from what I've said is going to be in that sort of ten to fifteen percent of people for whom modulators won't work, even if they live in a country rich enough to afford to buy them. Um, and one of the main areas of focus for, from the big funders, particularly in the states, recently has been on. Um, trying to sort of support gene therapies, gene editing, etc., for that group of patients. I think that's going to be some time away, um, but but hope that at least with a lot of energy going into that, we may be able to make some progress. But please do um, unmute and ask any other questions. Well, maybe people are keen to get back to their clinical work. Um, Andy, did you want to say something about next week? Yes, thanks, Jane. So next week is the last of this term's sessions. It's Rishi Pavari on, on sleep, paediatric sleep. Uh, and then we're going to have a month's break and we'll restart. What I'd, we'd also, we'd really like to hear from the trainees in particular, uh, do you still want this? Do you have any ideas about what you'd like? This is a, a pediatric, general pediatric session, not just respiratory. So please let me know. Um, I'm on the Imperial list, a.bush at imperial.ac.uk. Um, please, this is also going to be available online. I'd remind people and anybody who hasn't got the link, um, email us and we can send it to you. Uh, so Jane, thanks very much indeed for taking time for this. Thanks everybody and have a great day and a great weekend to follow. Thank you You're very welcome. much. Jane. Thanks, thanks Andy and thanks Nicola and thanks everyone for listening. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Thanks Jane.